Vegas, Nevada. This is videotape number 12. Hit them where it hurts. Finding holes in COTS software. Okay, so, um, hello. I hope you had a good lunch. And I hope you're not too sleepy after lunch because my speech will be boring enough, enough as it is. And my name is Halvar. I'm a reverse engineer for Black Hat Consulting. And, well, I'm going to speak about how to find security vulnerabilities in closed source software. And um, this, this entire speech will be pretty long. And therefore, it's been split into two halves. And the first half will begin with some legal mumbo jumbo concerning reverse engineering. Because technically, when you do reverse engineer, you're, well, not exactly threading on safe grounds. So um, you have to be aware of a few issues concerning this because you can get your well, you can get your ass sued off when you do it, <laughs> unless you live in a nice third world country like uh, Thailand, Asia, somewhere. They don't really have stringent laws concerning this, so it's a nice place to move, anyways. <laughs> All right. After I've gone over the law crap. I'll move on to the introduction to the topic of analyzing closed source software for security vulnerabilities and reliability and cover the various approaches that are used these days to, well, get an idea of how good software is or even find zero day. So as soon as we're done with the different approaches, I'll cover the various or the most common C, C++ programming mistakes that are being made over and over again all the time. And there are those that we are on the lookout for because they will give us the, well, capability of executing arbitrary code on somebody else's computer. And that's always a fun thing to do. I'll then move on in, uh, well, to the process of spotting these things in the binary where no source is available, specifically in the x86 disassembly. Afterwards, I'll demonstrate how to find a buffer overrun or, well, yeah, I'm find, find a vulnerability in a piece of crap software. <laughs> and then we all need a break, especially me. So this is the video spinner. Um, I think it's coming out here. This is a split, uh, like a switch. Well, the output is here. Well, yeah, I want the splitter in here, and we put these two on there. Okay. No splitter for me yet. <laughs> Who's playing with the lights? <coughs> ah. Okay. So. After we've all had our coffee and uh, tried to wake up during the break, I'll continue with how to patch the binaries in case your vendor is not as responsive as you'd like him to be. I'll then well, go over the theory of dealing with runtime encrypted binaries because you sometimes stumble over those. Uh, I'll not go into the, the real hands-on with that because that's something that can easily take about a week and furthermore, Microsoft always wants me to speak about um, digital rights management and reverse engineering and stuff, and I'm not going to do that, so. I'll then go into the process of automating the boring stuff. Um, staring at a disassembly is nobody's favorite pastime, not even mine. And it's, well, always good if you can have a script do your work and you go off to lunch. So um, I'll cover how I wrote a script to scan for suspicious printfs sprint so that can potentially to buffer overruns. Contrary to what the slide says, I'm not going to cover um, how to automatically scan for STRN copies because the script is so buggy that I'm a bit afraid it will blow up on me if I show it. So <clears throat> I will cover uh, automated scanning for format string bugs though in firewall one. Um, afterwards, I'll go into the process of reconstructing structures automatically, which you will need to do in order to analyze more complex software, which uses lots of structures. And then I'll speak a bit about how to extend this to OOP code, 
how to analyze stuff like IIS, which is a pain in the rear to reverse engineer without being able to reconstruct classes, because OOP code is really ugly when disassembled. And unless you can reconstruct class data structures, <laughs> what kind of joke is this? <laughs> Hey there. <laughs> all right, all right. All is okay, all is normal. <laughs> um, well, and after I'm done with the um, C++ OOP stuff, I'll have free time to answer any questions. But actually, if you have any questions during the speech, just yell. I'll gladly interrupt the speech and answer any questions you might have, as, lo as long as they're not in relation to digital rights management. Okay. <coughs> Turn it off? Uh, 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 well, uh, it's not really me who's uh, in charge of the PA here. I'll just continue talking. It's the legal stuff now anyway, so. Okay, so uh, when you do reverse engineer, then you're basically breaking the license agreement that comes with the software, and you're always obliged to click on it when you install it. So basically, by breaking this contract, you become liable for any damages you cause. This is bad, because if you find some nice format string bug in a high-profile e-commerce application or wherever, and some kiddies go out and own a server, well, format the hard drive a bit afterwards, and um, the company suffers image loss and all that thing, all those things, um, you can get sued for quite insane amounts of money, so you don't really want to do that. And fortunately, there are a few laws that do permit reverse engineering for certain purposes. Unfortunately, these laws do not really cover you. So, <laughs> Now, depending where you're living, these laws are different. In the EU, there are a few laws. In the US, there are a few laws. In Asia, there's no law. So um, I'll cover the U European Union stuff first. Um, there is a 1991 European Union directive covering the legal protection of computer programs. Now, this is not a law. It's a directive. So, a directive is not a law. It just tells courts to act in a certain way, but does not force courts to act in a certain way. You don't have to understand, uh, understand this. I for sure don't. But um, this directive gives a reverse engineer the right to decompilation for interoperability and for error correction. Now, if you read the fine print or read what's not written there, it does not give you the right for error detection. So um, once you know there's a bug, you're allowed to reverse engineer to fix it, but you're not allowed to find it in the first place using reverse engineering. So if you post something to backtrack, hey, I found this while I was digging around on the disassembly, you can get screwed. <laughs> so. If you do reverse engineering in Europe and you find some neat zero day, keep it private. Okay, um, in the USA, we have the DMCA and everybody loves the DMCA. <laughs> Actually, in this case, don't you know the song DMCA? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> unless you get sued for copyright infringement. <laughs> All right, um, anyways. The DMCA does have some good parts. It grants you the right for reverse engineering for interoperability, encryption research, and security testing. So you would think that what we're doing is security testing. Well, it's right, and you have the right to reverse engineer. Unfortunately, the DMCA also grants the author of the program the full um, intellectual property rights to his product. So any knowledge you gain from reverse engineering is his intellectual property. So if you publish bugs, he can claim intellectual ownership of that bug and sue you. Hey, this is not a joke. He can sue you that way. And you can get screwed that way. So if you're in the US and you find something using reverse engineering, keep it private. <laughs> so I think I'm pretty much done with the legal stuff. Hey, I, I do have a switch. Didn't notice that I have a second screen yet, so. Ooh. OK, the various approaches that exist to um, analyzing the reliability of software these days. The first one is stress testing. Basically, what you do is you create a lot of long and malformed strings and send them at an application. There have been a few, um, well, 
academic attempts to do this with the FUS project and so on. And there are a lot of Perl scripts, like about a million of them, who do this. And then there's um, advanced artificial intelligence um, <coughs> scanners like EI, EI's Retina, who features the same advanced inter artificial intelligence as Perl. And, um, <laughs> well, <laughs> So um, that program will do the same job if you're um, more into clicking stuff than writing Perl code. Anyways, there are certain advantages to this. First off, the process is very automatic. So you fire off the stress testing script, go to lunch, go to a party, come back, and hopefully you found a buffer overrun, or hopefully you've not found a buffer overrun, depending from where you're coming. So um, secondly, you don't need a really specialized or skilled person to use these things. I mean, everybody can write Perl. And I would presume everybody and his dog can use Retina. So um, it's not like you have to pay some highly skilled, expensive person like me. <laughs> Kidding. All right. Um, the stress testing tool sh is, in theory, reusable for any given protocol. So if you're stress testing SMT or whatever, you can use that stress testing tool on all SMTP servers you know, like Exchange and Domino and so on. Now, this is only a theoretical pro because in reality, nobody really, well, ad adheres to the RFC. I mean, Ophir Arkin's entire work is based on people being uh, incapable of following RFCs. And don't expect mail servers to follow the RFC. So every mail server is basically talking a slightly different dialect of SMTP. And if your stress testing tool happens not to know that or not to know the particularities of the dialect, it will not find important things because it misses entire code branches. Okay, so the cons of this approach are, first off, you have to know the protocol. And as I mentioned before, that is not always the case. And especially with some proprietary software, with some proprietary software, then, well, you're screwed because they don't have any documentation in the first place. Second disadvantage is you will miss complex conditions involving more than one factor. As soon as two factors are involved, stress testing will not do it anymore because the complexity of testing all variations of two factors, assuming you have a string of like, well, you want to send two strings with all possible combinations from size 1 to size 1024. The complexity increases exponentially. So the more factors which are involved in a given vulnerability, the more complex it is to find these with stress testing. I would think that um, some of the more complex conditions have probably the complexity that you will not find them until the universe has gone cold and dead using stress testing. Okay. Another problem with stress testing is application level exception handling. You have this under VMS, you have this under NT, and under certain C++ libraries you might have this as well, where the application handles all exceptions and just kills this threat. So the stress testing tool will never know what happens. Just know that the server doesn't respond in a way it's supposed to, but you will not have a sec fault, you will not have any signals, whatever. You just don't know what's going on. Actually, that's what happens when um, you try to use a format string bug in Firewall 1 to crash it. Um, well, it just sits there and does nothing because it does application level or application side exception handling. The final problem with um, stress testing is that you will not find funky stuff like malloc overrides because these things, well, depend on the data which overrides your buffer having certain bits set in certain places at a certain time. And as I said, stress testing doesn't know what's going on program internally, so you'll miss all of this. Okay, second approach is tracing input. This is what Joey demonstrated in Asia about uh, one and a half years ago, where you basically disassemble an application and then identify where the data is coming in and read from there and figure out how this data is being handled. Now, um, this does have the advantage of spotting even incredibly complex problems because you have a re human actually reading all the code that the program, well, that handles user input. So um, that's one of the main, main advantages of this. Unfortunately, with large programs, there are so many ways that um, data can come in, come in that you will have trouble identifying which code is the data handler. Take a firewall, for example. It takes data from all kinds of sources. It takes data from the various application proxies it has, then from the administrative client, whatever. So um, this is really only an option for CGIs and small programs where you can quickly get an overview of what's going on, and you have a clearly defined way of putting data in there. 
So the cons are also that you need somebody like Joey to do it. And that's expensive. And secondly, it's nearly infeasible for large applications as you'll be tracing down so many annoying code tentacles or even dead code. So um, you'll grow old before you've looked through a decent size application. Well, mentioned that already. Okay, third approach is what I use. I'm a lazy bastard, so I figured a way to make things more easy for me. Basically, I define a bunch of common mistakes that apparently all closed source programmers repeatedly make. And when I analyze or I scan for them in the binary, I look for them in the binary, identify the suspicious constructs first, and then I know that there's a bug. And then I read the code backwards to see how the program actually came to this point. This does have a few advantages. First off, it's a lot less time consuming than approach B. And by a lot less, I mean um, factor 10, factor 20 less. And I don't really enjoy staring at a dis dis at disassembly well, for a long time. And actually, I do enjoy being outside a lot more than standing in here. And um, I'm not the kind of person that would spend like 40 hours in front of a screen a week. So any kind of, well, saving time in front of the screen is good. And that's why I'm not reading too much of it. Uh, the second point is you can automate the detection of suspicious constructs. And automation will, well, just do wonders for your productivity because you're not bothered with the boring stuff anymore. Computers are there for doing boring stuff. So you automate the boring parts of the detection process and you only do the interesting stuff. So that is something that really drives up complex or um, productivity on your side. All right, next advantage is that you'll even find comp fairly complex conditions involving many factors. So you'll find a lot of zero day. The cons to this approach is that you will miss vulnerabilities. You will miss vulnerabilities because you're not reading all the code, you're only reading the code that is relevant and that has anything to do with suspicious constructs. Now, if there are vulnerabilities that the programmer, well, programmers have hand created, like they roll their own base64 decoding engine which does not do size checking, and they don't use any standard library functions of which you know that they are dangerous, you will miss all problems involving this as you're only looking for the standard function, functions to cause problems. So if you can, well, live with missing a few vulnerabilities, then this is all right, but still it's a con, you can't really secure th systems using this. But who would want that? All right, you need a highly specialized auditor to do it in the first place. So um, you need somebody with a lot of reverse engineering experience. With a lot, I mean like at least two years. So it's not really like you can quickly pick this up. At, le at least that's what I like to think, so. Okay, another main problem is you'll find mostly obscure and esoteric conditions. You'll find a lot of stuff which is not really relevant or not really exploitable because you look for bugs, but you don't look whether you can put data in there. So you'll have quite a few frustrating moments. Um, last New Year, I was in Berlin at the CCC Congress, and a friend of me and me, we analyzed the Linux FTP daemon and CFTPD for format string bugs, and we found a few. Unfortunately, you have to be rude to write through the files where the data is being read from anyways. So you're like, hey, I found this format string bug, and half, half an hour later, you're Okay, move on. And that happens all the time. You find tremendous amounts of bugs, and a lot of them are not relevant to you. Take IIS for an example. I have had a look at the Microsoft FTP server last week for an hour, and identified a few format string bugs. But they are in dead code, which is never reached. Which is quite amazing, because 30% of IIS are dead code, which is never reached. <laughs> You don't really know why this is the case, but it's quite amazing. So um, is Microsoft running a debug compile of uh, Microsoft FTP somewhere? Because it seems that many of those format string bugs are only present in the debug compile. Well, is anyone here from Microsoft who can answer that question? Rooster? <laughs> no, <laughs> okay. All right, um, so I mentioned before that um, you can't really secure systems using the approach that I do. It's more of a black hat technique in a way because the black hat wants the fastest way to find a vulnerability and he doesn't care if he misses problems as long as he gets in. He only needs one vulnerability to own the server. So he wants to save time, he wants to get in quickly and get back on IRC. <laughs> so 
Um, and once he has found something, as he's a reverse engineer and is not allowed to publish it anyways if he doesn't want to get sued, he keeps it private. So he doesn't have to repeat this boring process of reading disassembly until somebody actually finds this bug and makes it public and it gets fixed. So the black hat can have a stack of zero-day exploits sitting somewhere for years and, um, well, lie at the pool or be on IRC all day and still have his, achieved his goals. While the white hat is in a way worse position. He wants security, so he has to read all the code. And as a disassembly of an application can easily exceed eight megabytes, and I have not yet seen a human which is capable of reading eight megabytes of disassembly, um, well, you're in trouble. Secondly, you have to repeat the process with every upgrade because you don't really know what the, render, what the vendor has added. And if you found that, you have to see how it interacts with the rest of the application and so on. So um, while the black hat is partying somewhere with nice girls and everything, you're sitting in front of the screen doing nothing. <laughs> so, and the white hat does have to continue even after he has found something. He's not done. The black hat is done. So you can see why black hats are usually more relaxed than white hats. <laughs> All right. This doesn't apply to in-house Well, uh, okay. Are there any? <laughs> Never mind. It's a joke between friends. <laughs> He's from Checkpoint. <laughs> Anyways, um, the tools you need as an auditor or as a binary auditor um, that really depends, but one tool you will not want to live without is IDA Pro by a crazy Russian named Ilfa Gilfanov who lives in Belgium now. And actually the feature list is a lot longer by now. It grows so fast that I can't adjust the slides properly. So um, basically IDA can disassemble everything. Your cell phone, my toaster, your PlayStation, IA64, Itanium, um, whatever you chuck at it pretty much. Uh, Intel 960 as well, all the DSL modem code is running on that. Then it includes a powerful scripting language, which is very good if you're lazy. It can recognize statically linked library calls, so you don't have to go around identifying string copies. Um, it features a powerful plugin interface, which is very, very cool because you can, well, have full access to the disassembly database using C or um, if you feel like a real programmer, C++. Um, it automatically reconstructs arguments to standard library calls. You feed it a C header file and it generates defines so you can well, replace stupid hex values in the disassembly with real text. Very nice. Um, it does feature a graphing plugin which gives you flowcharts of disassemblies which is very cool to impress your management. Um, and the really cool thing is the technical support because you're actually communicating with the main developer and um, I have to speak for myself, he has added at least four features in IDA just for me. I constantly kept crashing the internal scripting language because it was not intended to use recursion. And um, he added quite a few things for that. So um, it's just, he's a very cool guy. The software is not that expensive compared to um, other things and for the, it costs around 500 US I think. So for the stuff you're getting for it, it's definitely worth it. And he's a cool guy too, so support him. Uh, no, I'm not paid by data rescue. Okay. Any questions so far? No? Nice. We'll move on to C, C++ auditing, or the usual programming mistakes which everybody seems to make. I don't think I'm telling anyone anything new when I tell you string copy and string catch might be bad. So, basically, if you have a string copy or a string cat, which copies stuff that is not enclosed in double quotes into a buffer, you might have a problem and you should probably look at this a bit more closely. I told you that my speech is boring. I'm moving on to Sprintf. Um, Sprintf is uh, dangerous as well if people do not use the built-in size checking. So if they expand user data or untrusted data, data which is not enclosed in double quotes, using a form, uh, format string which contains a percent %s, well, then it's probably dangerous. This goes for all functions which have sprintf-like functionality using the vsprintf function as well. Okay, scanf. <laughs> Sorry. Scanf is, um, well, basically broken as a prototype. So any scanf, well, scanf always parses untrusted data. 
there's no use to use there's no wait a second there's no sense in using scanf to parse trusted data so um, basically whenever you see a scanf with a percent s in the format string you know this is dangerous and furthermore even if you do use the built-in size checking in scanf um, you have to pay attention where it null terminates because this seems to depend from compiler to compiler so um, well, I got burned pretty badly with this because in my class, which I was teaching here, I had an example program which was supposed to contain all the usual bugs. Unfortunately, what I didn't know is that, well, my scanf implementation would, if I use size checking, like percent %200s to parse 200 bytes in a buffer, would terminate that buffer behind its end. So there were, like, unintentional bugs in my program as well, which is bad. So don't trust me to write secure code. Anyways, scanf is broken from front to back. <laughs> and even if you're parsing stuff like numbers, be careful because a hacker might put a negative sign in front of it. So scanf is bad. STRN CPY, the supposedly safe prototype for copying strings, um, which has the problem that it will not null terminate properly if the size of the destination buffer is equal to the maximum length parameter. Another problem it does have is that it will zero out the entire rest of the buffer. So if you are STRN copying with a very large buffer, uh, you might have a severe performance impact because it keeps on adding zeros until the very end of the buffer. Okay, so um, if you ever see an STRN copy with the maximum length parameter being equal to the size of the destination buffer, you know that this does not null terminate and this can lead to very funky problems. Just to make things a bit more visual, you have the source string with a terminating null byte and then arbitrary data behind it. And then you copy this stuff into a smaller buffer without properly null terminating. So you have the destination string and arbitrary data behind it. And every string operation which operates on the destination string now will operate on the data behind the original string as well. This has very cool effects from time to time. What was this? Oh. Thank you, it's not me. Um, anyways, um, you'll have some, this is weird. Um, <laughs> you'll have some quite interesting effects because it can happen that um, an application echoes back its own stack to you, things like that when they're just printing that out or sending stuff straight back to the user. And um, it can have more severe effects because you can, people can do a string re or like a character replace on that destination string and replace, well, a re bytes inside a return address or whatever. And it can have the straight boring impact of a buffer overrun later on. So SDRN copy is not that risk free. SDRN cat, this is my personal favorite because nobody seems to be using it correctly or hardly anybody. Um, to make things nice and consistent and easy for the programmer to remember, in contrast to SDRN copy, SDRN cat always null terminates, but behind your original buffer if you use size of destination buffer. So strn cat terminates after it has written up to max len bytes. So um, there's the famous off by one exploits which come from this if you overwrite the frame pointer on the stack in un unoptimized code. Things look a bit like this. Um, now you have to all get up and stand upside down, like stand on your head because in my diagram, the stack goes upwards. Sorry, didn't notice that until I was done. Okay, so here we go. We have the stack. In blue, we have the buffer to which we append. In white, we have the saved um, frame pointer. And in red, we have the saved EIP, which normally we would overwrite, but in this case, we don't. So we append to our buffer and append, whoa, hit once too often, sorry. How do I go backwards here? Okay. Uh, all right. Okay. So we're overriding EBPs or the saved EBPs lowest order byte with a null. So when the function epilogue of the function we're in executes, it will move the current register EBP into ESP, thus erasing all local variables. It will then pop EBP, our modified EBP value, into EBP, and then return regularly. So our frame pointer has now been modified. What happens now is when the next function returns, 
it executes the same epilogue again. So it moves eBP into ESP. So instead of the stack pointer pointing where it should point, it slides upwards in the diagram into user supplied data. And when the function returns, it will pop the return address out of the user supplied data instead of from where it's supposed to come. So at this point, you get full control. And this is one of the reasons why I love strncat. The other reason why I love strncat is that it has to deal with dynamic values for the maximum length parameter. Dynamic values are evil in a way that programmers tend to neglect the fact that beneath null or beneath zero, there's four gigabytes or four billion. So um, if you have code like this, the strn copy will fill the buffer completely so that the string length of the buffer equals the size of the buffer. And when the strn cat executes afterwards, wait a second, as size of the buffer is equal to the string length of the buffer, this evaluates to null or to zero. So if you subtract one from that, you get uh, four billion, which is a pretty long string to append. Cast scrubs. These I love most because people who write security, well, oriented code seem to always make them. Um, this is code from the loft, from anti-sniff. Uh, it is pretty old by now, so they have fixed it about a year ago or so. A friend of mine from a German group, Teso, found this one. Does anybody spot the mistake? You got the, um, anybody who has not seen this presentation before. So if anybody who I don't recognize spots the mistake, he'll get a book. The data at DNS label is user supplied. So, uh, DNS label is user supplied. It can be anything. Yeah. So, yeah, there is an applied cast, and what happens? Well, it could be anything, and what's the consequence of that? So, could you try to speak a bit more? <laughs> Yeah, but can you explain more what is happening? Or, well, it's clear there's going to be an open. Put in a character when it translates it into the code, that causes that open, right? Actually, no, you see there's an strn cat. So? Count is fine. Yeah. And you're just uh, assigning a character to it that will uh, upgrade it to the 32 bit new sign extension. Good, and what happens then? Well, that's essentially the point, so I think you've won a book. But can you catch? Yeah. All right. So what happens here is that the data at DNS label is user supplied. So let's assume somebody supplies the character 80 hex there, which is minus 128. Remember, char is signed and s is int. Int and char do have signs. So this value is being cast to the int count, where it's extended to FFFFF80, which is minus 128. Now, you see this calculation here? Um, count plus the string length of buffer has to be smaller than size of buffer minus 1. Now, count is minus 128. The string length of buffer is probably around 300 bytes or something. So you basically subtract 128 from the string length of buffer and, um, well, pass the signed comparison. And what happens then is, boom, you append an arbitrary or a print buffer which is way larger than 256. So um, these things are a bit subtle to spot in the source and they're not really easier to spot in the binary. So, well, only if you feel very brave, look for them. Um, on the other hand, it's really fun because um, all the, or many of the security conscious people do these kind of mistakes. 
um, uh, the current editor-in-chief of Frack, Raut, um, had one of those in his update to Gopher Demon where he was supposed to fix a bug. And uh, Loft fixed this one twice before they got it right. So they are fun in a way. <laughs> and it's always good to be the guy who um, is analyzing the code instead of the guy who's writing the code. <laughs> okay, format string vulnerabilities. These have pretty much been covered to death for the last year. Um, they've been known to certain people from France probably for a few years before they got public. Um, knowledge about these has circulated uh, in certain circles for a long time. And they got public last year. And for all of a sudden, everything was vulnerable, which is fun. But unfortunately, they're all getting fixed because they're so easy to find. At least in the open source software, uh, in closed source, that's an entirely different story. Closed source programmers can't use grep. <coughs> okay, you can really find print or format string bugs as an argument deficiency. A valid call to a printf family function has at least two arguments, the format string and the stuff you're expanding. So um, whenever you have one argument too few, then you should be on the lookout. And if that format string is then not static, like not enclosed in double quotes, you definitely have a format string bug and you should look really closely. Um, actually, these are very, very incredibly easy to spot. There are compiler patches which will effectively flag all the format string bugs. They can be scanned like this in the binary. It's really amazing to see them still around. Well, um, I guess that's what people are saying about buffer overruns all the time anyways. But format string bugs really are easy to find. Buffer overruns can be very subtle. Format string bugs are not. So have fun with them while they're still here. Format string bugs. Think so? Well, then just patch the damn compiler. All right, so um, I'll quickly go over the theory of exploiting format string bugs. If you want to, I can even make a small demonstration, but um, if not, not. Is, this, is there any interest in doing a demonstration on how you write to arbitrary addresses using format strings? Yes? Okay. So I'll first go over the theory and then switch screens and stuff. Okay, now normally what happens during a printf family function call is you have the format characters and the arguments. And for every format character the printf family function parses, it slides up in the stack to look for the parameter. For var run, it slides up once to look it up. For buff, it slides up one to look it up. And for var two, it slides up one to look it up. So when you're dealing with a format string bug, somebody is just print or just does a print of stuff. And if a malicious attacker puts stuff in here, something like percent dot 200 LX, percent N, percent 40 LX, percent N, then what will happen is, it's, this is a bit simplified now, but what will happen is that the printf will print 200 characters from the first double word it takes from the stack there. And it will then move on to take the percent n format string character, which will write the length of the string which, which has been outputted so far to the location pointed to on the stack. So if this data, which down there is attacker supplied, we're now writing the value 200 to any location in memory where he well, wants to write to. We then output 40 more bytes, and then we write the value 240 somewhere. And well, that way you can pretty much write anything, anywhere, anytime. I'll just try to get the screen switched and a simple example working here. Let's see whether the switch works. Ah, OK, 
Okay, um, this is a very, very extreme simple example of a small format string bug. It creates a buffer on the stack and it then does a faulty printf. So, what happens when you execute this is first, no, uh, wait a second, I gotta put this microphone somewhere. just echo stuff back first of all. So what we'll now do is so you see that we're reading stuff from the stack there, the 41s, 41s, 41s is our user supply data. So at this point we know that we can write well to the location 41, 41, 41, 41 and if we change those a's to other values, we can write to any location. I'll demonstrate that a bit. Hey, um, something that I don't, didn't know before was that NT has something like debug.com in the good old DOS days. It has something like a command line debugger. Thanks to the Microsoft guys who I talked to who told me that. I'll just switch this off for a second. Okay, um, we've now sent or used the, the argument a, 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 a percent LX or percent 100 LX percent N. As you can see now, we have a sec fault here or an access violation. Can you, can you lower the resolution? The, oh, no, I don't think so. Wait a second. Well, maximizing it will not help with it. Is this more readable? Okay. All right, um, so you can see the assembly down there. Move EAX or move the value in ECX to the location point to at EAX. We have supplied EAX here, right here. And we're moving the value in ECX, which is the current length of the string into that location. So we'll quit this first. And you can see that the value we're writing, what? Oh. There we go. We can see that the value ECX uh, in ECX has increased by 20 as we just added 20 more to the percent 100 LX. So we can put pretty much any value in ECX and write it to any location. And, um, well, that's pretty much the way you do format string exploitation. It's not really hard. In fact, it's a lot easier than buffer overruns in many cases, so. Um, another thing which is nice about format string bugs is as you're writing to arbitrary locations, you cannot only, um, well, overwrite stuff like return addresses, but you can, ma like, manipulate the internal logic of a program. Now, assuming that we have a switch to IA64 or whatever, and that well, platform would allow us to have pages in memory or which are readable and writable but not executable. So at this point, it is theoretically possible to create an operating system which prevents illicit code execution completely because the attacker cannot put code somewhere in memory which he is allowed to execute. So um, what the format string bugs allow us then is to manipulate variables. So even if we get an operating system which allows us not to execute un or illicit code, we can still manipulate the logic of the program and that's, well, that can still have devastating effects. So we quit this and move on. 
Okay, so x86 assembly recap. Um, for those that have not spent hours in front of the dis disassembler recently, um, a quick recap. We're mostly dealing with standard C declaration calls, and in standard C declaration calls on an x86 platform, the nth push before the call corresponds to the nth argument to the call. So in this case, first argument, first push, second argument, second push, third argument, third push. Okay, an example of a dangerous string copy or string cat call in the disassembly. We can see that we're targeting, uh, that we don't have a dynamic, but don't have a static source. So it's not enclosed in double quotes, and therefore it is potentially untrusted. Secondly, we have a target as, or our target is a stack buffer of about 1,000 byte size. So this is potentially dangerous and should be investigated further. Secondly, um, sprintf and vsprintf calls. Um, well, in this case, we have a stack buffer as a target of fixed size. And then we have untrusted data, not, which is not enclosed in double quotes, which is being expanded using no size checking in percent %s. So this has to be considered dangerous as well. Scanf. There's a percent %s in the format string. And we're parsing into stack buffers or into buffers of fixed size. And the source is potentially untrusted. STRN copy, STRN cat. Well, we know that any STRN copy or STRN cat call where the source buffer, well, well, where the maximum parameter is of equal length to the destination buffer, or is equal to the length of the destination buffer. English grammar is hard. Um, it's dangerous, so we copy untrusted data in a fixed size buffer again. And we know that if the source, or if the destination buffer is equal to 4,000, this has to be considered dangerous. So we open up the stack window in our disassembler, and it tells you the size of the target buffer, which is 4,000. So this call would be considered dangerous as well. OK, another SGRN cat pitfall. I mentioned before that you have to pay close attention to um, wraparounds in the maximum length parameter in SGRN cat. So in this case, something is subtracted right before the maximum parameter is getting passed. And well, you learn in first, gr first grade, I think, that subtractions can lead to negative results or to null. And negative results are bad in a double word meaning. OK, cast scrubs. Um, we already found out that these can be pretty annoying to detect in the source. They get even more annoying to detect in the binary. Um, First off, you should create a list of all functions that use a size t parameter to copy data. strn cat, strn copy, f gets, receive, send, all these things. Um, secondly, when you analyze these functions, you check first if the size t is dynamic or static. If it is static, hardwired, you're not in danger. There's no way the programmer can screw up that. If it's dynamic, you should have a close look at it. Either is it accessed before or loaded before using the move as x instruction, move with sign extend, or has it been subtracted right before? So these are two things to look out for. Another thing to look out for is incorrect um, usage of signed things or signed values in loops and comparisons. So if in the disassembly you're encountering comparisons and conditional jumps, remember that jump above and jump below are signed values and um, jump lower and jump greater are the unsigned equivalents. So it's usually a good idea to look for those as well. All right. So we mentioned, or I mentioned before, that format string bugs can be redefined as argument efficiencies. And in the non-optimized x86 world, you have the great advantage of something called stack correction. After a function has been called, it has to, well, pop the stuff it has put on the stack off the stack. So after the call, you usually have something like at ESP something. 
And this add ESP tells you how many arguments a certain call had. So um, at this point, we can de determine that we have an argument deficiency. The current num or correct number of arguments to sprintf is three. Target buffer, format string, stuff expanded in the format string. So if you divide the stack correction by four, you get the amount of parameters or the number of parameters. In this case, we're missing one as we only have two parameters. So this would be dangerous. After we've determined that we have an argument deficiency, we have to check whether the format string is static or dynamic, because you don't want to flag something like printf hello world as dangerous. So in this case, the format string is dynamic, so it might be dangerous. OK, so I'm now supposed to demonstrate how to find these vulnerabilities. For this, I'll switch over. Oops, that was one too far. Hello? So I mentioned before that I was going to find a bug in a piece of crap software. Um, the piece of crap software of the day is called CSM Proxy Pro, or Proxy Plus, or whatever. And it's a proxy server, um, well, it's a shareware proxy server, which can be found at csm-usa.net or csm-usa.com or whatever. And uh, the reason why I chose this is because I know the programmers are really bad. <laughs> and um, I've, I've looked at the web server before, and um, it started out with parsing every request, every HTTP request using scanf percent s into 400 byte buffers. So after I had a look at the, at the web server, actually the web server was the first overflow I ever found. I was a small kid and blasting long strings at it, and it died. So when I was looking for an easy target, I kind of remembered that company. And um, actually, when we told that company about the faulty web server, they said, hey, um, we don't support that product anymore. You're on your own. <laughs> so um, I thought, let's have a look at this one. And as we know, the programmers can't use scanf. We're going to look for scanf first. So let's hope I don't get feedback here. Uh, it's too small. My microphone is too large. Can everybody hear me? Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> this is the scanf function inside um, the executable which the disassembler has um, identified. So I hit Control X to see how many calls to scanf we have in total here. It's 29. And. Um, you will now get a good idea of um, why I wrote those scripts, because doing this manually is incredibly boring. And, um, yeah? Uh, is something wrong? Um, trying to turn this has this. E oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let's just move on. Um, OK, so um, this is incredibly boring, because we have to check a lot of scanf calls now. Let's check the first scanf. We have a format string with percent %d. We want a percent %s. This is not interesting. 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 Scripting is cool, not interesting. <laughs> not interesting. 
not interesting, not interesting, not interesting, not interesting. Whoa! Nice. So, um, once you've found something that looks fishy, you have first to do some uh, buffer size arithmetics. Because sometimes there's programming bugs, or frequently you'll find programming bugs that don't really have a security impact because you're not overriding anything useful. So, in this case, we can see that we're parsing data from a 1024 byte buffer into three, oops, three 128 byte buffers on the stack. Our return address sits here, our frame pointer, pointer sits here, the source is here, and the buffer closest to the return address is here. So even if we try to overflow this buffer using 1024 bytes, we'll completely overflow it, we'll overwrite var 404, and we'll get stuck somewhere here before the end of the source buffer. So um, unless the program does something really fishy with var 404, we don't have, or we haven't gained anything from this. So we try to figure out what's going on with var 404. And um, as you can see down here, var 404 gets overwritten right after the scanf call. So whatever value we put in here, it's gone by this line. So um, basically, we're back to not interesting. <laughs> not interesting. Not interesting. Oh, OK. Another percent %s. We're targeting a 128-byte buffer, which is right next to the stack, or right next to the return address, here. And basically, the source is a pointer, which is the first argument to the function we're in. IDA names the arguments to a function in a way that arc0 is the first one, arc4 is the second one, and so on. So we scroll to the very top of this function and see where that comes from. And here we go. This is the first argument. It's a buffer, which is inside some kind of structure, as arc4 is a structure pointer, and this buffer sits at offset 12 of that structure. So we scroll up a bit to see where this is coming from. Um, the names you see here, like do IMAP connection, um, they're not supposed to be there. Apparently, the author um, left debug information in their current build. Hey, that happens quite a lot. Actually, um, the Netscape guys, I, I fixed the format string bug in one of their um, SHTML parsing libraries, and they were nice enough to send me, like, oh, we fixed it, here it is, test that version, and full debug info was in there. <laughs> All right? Sure. Can Checkpoint do that once? <laughs> All right. Um, up here, we have the receive IMAP command. Now, this is really nice now because we know pretty much what's going on. So it receives an IMAP command. And as you can see here, it's passing the buffer as one of the arguments to this. So we can safely assume that receive IMAP command leads to a receive call down here. Well, that's a bit. Ah, here it is. So basically, we scroll up a bit more and see what's going on. And here we go. We got the function do IMAP connection or IMAP connection. And the program generates a nice banner here using sprintf, then sends it off to the guy who just connected, then receives up to 16,000 bytes from the user, and passes it on to split IMAP command. Remember, we only need 128 bytes to fill our buffer, and um, 136 bytes to smash the stack. So hypothetically, we would think that we just connect, send 136 bytes, and we would have a clear stack smash. So I have already configured the proxy to enable IMAP connections. No wonder they named their product Sesame.
Okay. So we connect to the IMAP port, start sending data. 80 bytes, 90 bytes, 100 bytes. I'm just trying to make it more dramatic. 120. <laughs> 120, 128, frame pointer, return address. And let's just hope that I didn't make a mistake counting. Whoops. Perhaps you should start a debugger. Perhaps you'll catch the exception. Most likely you'll not, but we'll see. Well, soft as usually doesn't catch exceptions too, too well, so it doesn't. But, oh, here we go. Oh, I, I made a mistake counting. So you can see that our EIP has been completely taken. Um, but apparently I had one A too much. So at this point we have a complete stack smash and complete control. And I think um, we found a vulnerability. Okay. So, um, does anybody know the exact time? Do I still have time to show how to fix this vulnerability before, before we're supposed to break? I got one minute? Okay, then I'm not fixing this. <laughs> All right, let's break. Thank you.